It's my great pleasure to be here, and I think we're going to have a great speaker. Uh, I'm going to introduce Chevre Buckman Gartner from the FDA, and Chevre is director of CDIT's Office of Translational Sciences. I'm sure she's going to give us some really good insights from the regulatory side of the world. If you're in biopharmaceuticals, you certainly deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think it's very interesting to really hear the view of the world from that point of view. So welcome, Chavre, and please, over to you. So I just want to um, thank um, bio and women in bio, especially, uh, for the opportunity to come and speak to you this evening. And uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for us, and especially really to give you a view of a bit of what's going on at FDA, a bit of what's uh, happening as far as transformative leadership at FDA, and where we're trying to move forward, um, and where we're trying to really work to, to build safer and effective medicines um, for the American public. So with that, I just want to show you a few slides. Um, and today, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit very quickly about my path to FDA, a little bit about leadership that we have at FDA, some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that we're grappling with, and some thoughts on what it takes to, to, to be a leader in this type of role. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from uh, Maryland, but moved to Louisville, Kentucky when I was a kid. <laughs> um, I'm a Washington University undergrad. I was at Washington University undergrad. I went to the School of Medicine. I uh, was in their medical scientist training program, and I did my MD, PhD there. Um, while I was working on my MD, PhD, I got a chance to really have a view of industry. Um, and I worked collaboratively with DuPont Merck as well as Monsanto Ciro at the time. Uh, then I went on uh, to do my pediatric residency at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, while I was there, I had a wonderful opportunity to work with uh, the CEO and the chief medical officer for Texas Children's Hospital. So everywhere that he went, I went, and I got a different view of medicine, and I got a different view of leadership. Um, and I had a chance also to work with the American Academy of Pediatrics. So I learned about opportunities for physicians, especially pediatricians, in different areas of advocacy for medical product development. Um, I then went to the FDA, where I was a medical officer in the Division of Pediatric Drug Development. I became a team leader there. Um, I attended as a, a pediatrician in the, one of the community clinics in Maryland. And then in 2006, I became the dire deputy director for the Office of Translational Sciences. Um, in 2007, soon after I became the deputy, a year later, the director at the time told me she was retiring. And so I went from being the deputy to the director of the office, and I've been the director since 2007. So just a little bit about FDA. Um, how many of you, just by a show of hands, have been to the White Oak campus? for FDA. A few folks. Okay. For those of you who don't know, we've been consolidating a lot of the headquarters for FDA, and this is on the picture that you see here. Um, the Office of the Commissioner is located there, as well as we're trying to consolidate many of our centers as well. I represent the Center for Drugs, and I'm the director of the Office of Translational Sciences. We also have a Center for Biologics. We have a Center for Devices and Radiologic Health food safety, veterinary medicine, uh, techno toxicologic research, that's out in Arkansas, and then a center for tobacco products. So this is a tremendous infrastructure that FDA um, has oversight of. And our, our mission is really to promote and protect um, the health of the public. And so the idea is really focused on ensuring the safety and efficacy and quality of human and veterinary drugs, biologic products, medical devices, ensuring the safety of foods in our nation's blood supply, regulating cosmetics, dietary supplements, radiation-emitting products, and tobacco products. That's a mouthful, and it's a tremendous amount that we have oversight of. What you may not know about us is that we have an annual budget of about $4.4 billion. We employ 15,705 employees. 77% um, of them have college degrees. 21% of them have doctorates. You can see on the slide the variety of folks that we employ. Um, we have 223 U.S. offices, 13 laboratories, 11 international offices, and posts in eight different countries. Um, what people don't realize is regulated products actually account for 20 to 25% of every dollar that's spent on consumer goods in this country. 
and we're responsible for oversight of two trillion in medical products for foods, cosmetics, dietary supplements, veterinary medicines, and tobacco. So it's a tremendous infrastructure. Really, I'm here to talk a little bit about CEDAR and CEDAR's leadership. I was at um, a lovely luncheon this afternoon that Demetra um, sponsored, and it was a wonderful opportunity to talk about women in leadership. And what one of the takeaways that I heard was about how many women sit at top leadership. And we talked about the goal of having at least 50% of women being in these top leadership positions on boards in areas that are tremendously influential. Well, I'm happy to report that if you look at this picture and you count how many women are in the picture, it is more than 50%. Our leader for CEDAR is Dr. Janet Woodcock, and she has been a tremendous advocate for women in leadership positions in the center, as well as a tremendous advocate throughout the FDA and beyond. And so you can see by the number of faces here, these are the people that are helping run the Center for Drugs. So I'll talk a little bit about my office. So in 2006, as I said, that's when the office was created. We went to a new campus. Things were still being built. So this was the former director at the time, Shirley Murphy. She came from GlaxoSmithKline, standing on a picnic table out in the middle of just an open area because we didn't have a big enough auditorium to house everybody at the time. So what you're seeing is much different from the way the campus looks now. And a lot of the leadership that was reporting to her was mostly male. And the two directors of the offices that reported to her at the time, the Office of Biostatistics and the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, were male. And um, when I transitioned um, in 2007 as the director, I had a big lift because I was very young and these people were much more senior than I. And I had a lot to do to prove why I could come to the table and lead a group of people. Where we are now um, is my office has over 500 staff. Um, this just shows you, I have four sub-offices that report to me. Um, the immediate office of the Office of Translational Science, the Office of Biostatistics, the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, the Office of Computational Science, and then our newest office is the Office of Study Integrity and Surveillance. The types of functional areas that we're involved in in the office have to do with translational medicine, uh, science and research oversight, biomarker development, technology transfer, health information technology, data mining, pharmacogenomics, bioequivalence inspections and support, computational science, modeling and simulation, pharmacometrics, um, also novel consortia efforts that I'll talk to you a little bit about, public-private partnerships and how we can work together to advance the science. So see, these are some of the areas that the offices that I have oversight over represent. I want to also show you some of the women leaders that we have in CEDAR. These are folks who report to me, and they head each of their sections in my office. Um, my deputy director, Susie McCune, um, our director of program management um, staff, Rhea McCree, the head of biostatistics, Lisa Lavange, the head of Office of Computational Science, Lillian Rosario. These are people with a tremendous amount of creativity, drive to accomplish things tenacity to really push until the doors open and execution and I am very honored to be able to work with these folks as well as a host of other people who really are tremendous in terms of helping us move forward. So some of the realities of the 21st century that we all know, you know, over two decades ago we lacked effective treatments for many life-threatening illnesses. Today many more treatments are available but we know that the patterns of drug manufacturing use and that guiding information have, dr have shifted dramatically. We know that patients and clinicians want the most accurate, up-to-date, and understandable information, and they want to ensure safe use, and they want that information as quickly as possible. We also know that new science has tremendous promise but it, except for accelerating product development, but in many cases it's lagged. So we know that FDA is one part of an extremely complex healthcare system. And we know also that influencing change is challenging, and we're learning that it requires a lot more collaboration. So many of you who are in the drug development, biotech space, you all know the drug development process. 
you know how many compounds um, go into the d drug discovery and preclinical phase. And you know ex exactly how long it takes in many cases to get one FDA-approved medicine. It's a tremendous amount of time. There is a tremendous amount of risk. And there are a lot of failures. And oftentimes those failures can occur very late in the development cycle. And that can be really tremendously uh, deleterious to a company. The average cost to develop one new medicine, um, is just from this graph from early 2006, was 1.2 billion. It's even higher than that now. So the challenge is how we really can work more effectively and efficiently to deliver on this promise of new science, how we can assure that patients are getting the new treatments that they need in a timely way. That is what we really want to be partnering with you to be able to help uh, advance. So this idea of us needing to strengthen and modernize the regulatory process, and there's a lot of aspects to this. We want to be able to expedite the review of products and provide increasingly early communication with developers. I was meeting with um, one woman this evening, and she said, well, you know, we have this new uh, drug that we're interested in pushing forward. How do we have that conversation? And I told her, you need to have that conversation with us as early as possible. I think some of the challenges that people run into is they wait. And they say, oh, I'm not going to talk to the FDA. I'm not ready yet. Well, what if this doesn't go well? Talk to us. You have to talk to us early. I, I think that is what we're really starting to learn, that early communication, early interaction is critical for us. We are also wanting to use more regulatory science to drive innovation and take advantage of scientific advances. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how we're trying to do that. We're strengthening the role of the patient in the development process. So I know that you all have heard about a, a lot of our patient-focused drug development efforts. We've had a lot of interactions with the external patient community. We're very focused on clinical outcome assessments. So this idea of how does a patient function, how do they feel after they're taking a drug? Not just what's the biomarker and did it go up or down, did their blood pressure drop, or did, you know, did their asthma FEV1 change, but how do they feel? What can you do that you couldn't do previously? So there's an increased focus on what that impact has and how the patient's voice needs to be heard. And then there's also a focus on increasing public-private partnerships and other collaborative ventures, including with academic institutions. So we realize that we can't do it alone. FDA does not have the world's you know, brain trust of all the people that are able to do this. We have to be working with you, and we have to find some of these pre-competitive areas that where we can collaborate and work together. So we have a unique vantage point from the FDA. We're a science-based regulatory agency, we have a public health mission, and we have a unique and essential role. We want to be a catalyst for innovation, not a barrier. We want to be able to identify unmet medical and public health needs and gaps in the product development pipeline and help communicate those. We want to be able to support fuller translation of those opportunities in science and technology into real-world products. And we want to enable monitoring and assessment of products throughout their development and use, so both pre- and post-market. And that takes a lot of different pieces to be able to do that. Mostly, I said, we want. I don't think we're there yet, but I think we have the vision of what we want to achieve. And much of that catalyst for that vision has been the leader of CEDAR, Janet Woodcock. She has really been a tremendous force in helping us to try and start to realize this vision of where we want to be. I want to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships. How many of you in the room know about public-private partnerships, what they are? Good. Okay. Fantastic. So the idea from our vantage point is, again, to say we have to partner to move science forward. It's not just about, oh, here's a tremendous um, new science discovery, but it's how do we move it forward? How do we get it into the clinic? How can we possibly find shared pre-competitive areas where different companies might even be able to come together and share their information? Some of those partners may be FDA, they could be NIH, academia, industry, and of course the patient groups. And we're seeing this happening. I pulled the slides out because I was going to bore you with consortia efforts, but we're seeing this happening. We're seeing all over, many people years ago did not think this would even happen, ever. They said, companies are never going to share this information, it's never going to happen, we're never going to see it. That has changed. And I think we are seeing the value, and I think we're seeing in a variety of areas where this can be tremendously effective. 
And they're doing it also in Europe, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which is the analog to the Critical Path Initiative, which was really articulating a lot of the things that I've been saying, which was Janet's brainchild as well, which is how do we get people to work together to solve the problems that we all know exist? So these consortia have done some tremendous things. Uh, an example of this has to do in areas of biomarker development and trying to see how we can collectively assess information that we have from a variety of different stakeholders to see whether we have novel biomarkers that may be able to help us predict safety more effectively, enrich clinical trial populations, help us to determine if there are possible bad outcomes sooner than waiting for you know, the drug to get on the market. We also have seen this um, effectively in areas where we're looking at clinical outcome assessments, um, areas where you want to know how a patient feels or how they function. Well, you don't want to have 10 different rating scales out there to do the same thing. Maybe you can work together and get to one or two that we also agree are useful so that then a drug developer or a manufacturer isn't spending a lot of time recreating the wheel to create a clinical outcome assessment. So these are examples where we're seeing the power of public-private partnerships helping us. Uh, another one of our women leaders at FDA who recently left FDA, and we were sad to hear this, was Peggy Hamburg, our commissioner. She was a big proponent of working to accelerate innovation and strengthen regulatory science. She said that it is increasingly clear that our most effective strategies are grounded in partnership. And she was a big advocate for us to be able to move forward. And a lot of this groundwork is in place now because of her efforts. So I want to change gears a little bit and also talk about human capital and training and attracting the best and the brightest people. Another thing we talked about today at the luncheon was this idea that we need to be developing more youth and more folks who are mid-career in science. And not only in science, but what does it take to translate something that might be an interesting scientific discovery into something that's a medical product that at the end of the day may help people. So to that end, and looking at training and opportunities, I have to put in a plug because we're always hiring at FDA, always, always, always. Um, so I, I have to put in a plug for usajobs.gov. But we also have what people may not know is we have fellowships. We have opportunities through a program called ORISE. Don't ask me to tell you what that acronym stands for. It's the Oak Ridge Research Something Science Something. But anyway, we have a collaboration with this group, and basically it helps us sponsor fellows who come embedded to work with us for up to two to maybe five years at a time to really understand what we do. And then they may go elsewhere. They may go back to academia. They may go into industry. But they understand the regulatory framework. We also have a commissioner's fellows program. We do sabbaticals. We have student volunteers. We also have special government employees. People don't realize how many ways FDA is trying to train people so that they understand what it takes. Uh, we were talking, I was talking with another colleague this evening about the challenges around academia and how they don't necessarily understand what it takes to really get a drug to market. Well, the only way we're able to start to communicate that to folks is we have to educate them. And, and part of that education is embedding with us. So um, these are all opportunities that we have. So this is our center director, Dr. Janet Woodcock. Um, she is a bundle of energy. I don't know where she finds the energy, day, night, weekends. I was talking to another colleague here who said she was just sitting in a board meeting with her today. It, she is tremendous, but um, I think what invigorates her is her optimism. And her quote here is, the bottom line is that I'm an optimist. These challenges don't discourage me. I get excited about them. And I always look on the bright side. We'll solve this problem and move on to the next. And I think that's how we've been able to move forward. So I was asked to just give you a few pearls, um, things that have helped me and things that I encourage my staff. And um, some people may say I'm a bit of a hard taskmaster. I, I set the bar very high and I only accept the best. And one of the things I tell my staff is, do what you say. I tell them to close the loop, meaning if you say you're going to do something, do it. <laughs> Ask questions. And um, you know, this, this afternoon during the luncheon, we talked about this idea of women needing to ask and ask questions and stand up and be seen 
and ask the hard questions. But you can ask questions in a variety of ways. You can ask questions to mentor people. You can ask questions to guide people. You can also ask questions to get what you want. But I can guarantee you, if you don't ask the question, you'll never get the answer. I, t I tell people to listen. That's an art. I sometimes have this challenge where someone pre presents me with a challenge and I'm a problem solver, so I'm very quick to jump in. I, I listen to half the conversation and I'm ready to solve it. And so I constantly have to tell myself, step back and listen. My director, the former director, who was, I showed you the picture when she was standing on the picnic table uh, when we didn't have a space for us all to meet, she used to always say, speak up, sit at the table. Uh, I didn't realize at the time, back in 2006, when she was the director, I wouldn't sit at the table. She would sit at the table. And she would turn to me, because I was usually sitting around the perimeter of the room, and she would stop the meeting and she'd say, Chavre, what do you think? What do you want to do? I didn't realize at the time she was mentoring me, and she was also preparing me, because she knew she was going to leave, and she wanted to make sure I was ready. Declare your vision. I think this is a very challenging thing sometimes for people to do. And sometimes you're afraid, because you may fail, but you have to declare it because that helps people to align with you. And sometimes they might march behind you and you're not going anywhere very quickly. But declare your vision. Stand in front. Help others. We talked about this today as well. Helping others means mentoring other people. Helping others means looking out for those other folks that, that may not be where you are yet. It's a challenge. None of us have a lot of time. Uh, but I can guarantee you, when staff come to me and say, from all over the center and all over the agency, they come to me and say, will you work with me? My answer is yes. It's never no. And it's challenging, but it's an obligation. Share the credit. I've noticed that at times, we don't lift each other up. Sometimes it's hard to share the credit when you've done really 90% of the labor and another person has done 10%, but perhaps they're just emerging. They're someone who's getting off the ground with their career. Share the credit. Show them, show them and give them visibility. Say please and thank you. It is a lost art. You'd be amazed how many people do not say please and they don't say thank you. And it's, it's, it's difficult. It's really challenging when people don't do that because you can get a lot more bees with honey. And you would be amazed with the people that can influence your career. It may be the secretary, it may be the janitor, it may be a variety of people, but say please and thank you. Get an executive coach. This is something that people don't really think about. When I was in medical school, we, worked, uh, we had a woman who was a colleague in medical school, and she always had a tutor. She always had a tutor. And all of the medical students, we all thought, she must really not be doing very well. Maybe she's about to drop out. <laughs> In fact, she graduated at the very top of the class because she was using the coaching to polish, to polish the skills that she already had. And I think people lose sight of the fact that there are a variety of people that can help you. There are a variety of people that can mentor you. But executive coaches can sometimes help you see things about yourself that you don't even see. Say yes. Now, some people might say, you should say, say no. But I say, say yes. <laughs> um, when Dr. Woodcock, the director of the center, asks me to do things, my answer is always yes. Because I want to prove to her what I'm capable of. Because the more I'm able to show her that I can do, and I say yes, and I do what I say, and I close the loop, and I follow through, but the more that you're able to show someone what you're able to do, the more that they're going to offer you to do. Smile. That's something my mother always tells me. Um, you know, all of us have bad days. But when you're in a leadership role, you don't really get a lot of opportunities to have bad days. Because people are watching you. People are taking their cues from you. People's day is being influenced by your day. And so sometimes you have to, you have to always put on the good face. So with that, those are my pearls. I want to thank you for your time. I know you all have been standing, and I'm, I'm very understanding of standing for long periods of time. So um, I wanted to give you our contact information. 
There is so much that I could share with you. We're doing a lot of tremendous new things, but I wanted to at least share this with you, um, that if you have questions, concerns, I see, I'll leave this up for a little bit because I see cameras going up. Um, we, we really want to be in the mode of being responsive and visible and proactive and supporting innovation. And so we look forward to, to hearing from you. Um, with that, I will stop. I do want to, there is one thing I want to show you. I'll give the cameras a couple more seconds. <laughs> and then there is one thing I want to show you very quickly, and I'm going to have to change uh, slide decks real quick. When we were talking at um, uh, the, the luncheon session with Demetra and the panel, we were talking about this idea of how you develop people in science and how you get to the next level. And we were challenged, basically, to say, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do differently? And I, I want to talk to you. I want to pitch an idea to you. And um, this is this concept of developing robust education and training in regulatory science. Regulatory science is a very different field. It has to do with medical product development. It has to do with how we take things from the bench and discovery to actually products that are implemented and available for patients to use. Um, what we want to really be able to do is develop an education and training environment for this area and address gaps in traditional ed academic programs because you don't learn this stuff in school. I certainly in medical school didn't learn any of this and I'd hazard to say that many academic PhD programs don't discuss this either. We want to prepare the future regulatory science workforce. As I said, this is a definition of regulatory science. I'm going to go forward. We realize that there's enormous potential for academic programs involving regulatory science. And a lot of people may say they have this coursework and what have you, but I don't know that it necessarily meets all the needs that, that we really have. And so this idea of having a consortium has really developed, a regulatory science training consortium. And this idea is to bring together, just as I talked about, stakeholders from industry, professional organizations, academia, foundations, industry, <laughs> NIH, FDA, and really start to think about where do we need to build content? What is it that people don't know that they need to know? How do we start to develop people so that they understand the curriculum in terms of what this, what this takes? I had a unique opportunity in my path to, to being at FDA where I had a chance to be in academia. I had a chance to be in industry, and I had a chance to be in a regulatory environment. So I was able to see product development from all of those different viewpoints. Not many people have that opportunity. And so we are really talking about developing curriculum, developing academic exchange programs where people have a chance to train in these different environments, perhaps developing an arm that, that develops sabbaticals so that folks are able to work with us for periods of time while still retaining their, their, their normal job, and even fellowships so that we really have a chance for folks to be embedded with us. So this is the concept, and it's really about blended learning. It's about having things available to folks. What people don't realize is FDA does a lot of training for people all over the world. But the challenge with that training is it's not easily accessible. If we have an affiliation with you and we do a training for you, that's, that's buried somewhere, and it's not available for the rest of the world to see. What we want to do is start to lift that up and make it available. That frees us up so we're not duplicating efforts, but at the same time, it helps to raise, raise the bar for everyone so that they understand what are we looking at? What does it take to bring a product forward? What types of things do we look for in clinical trials? How should clinical trials be designed? Those types of things that people need to know when they're in this arena. Um, we've started to do some of this. We've developed case studies. We've also started to develop fellowship programs. Um, we have different affiliations with um, different academic institutions. This just gives you examples of some of the things that we have already off the ground. We have a variety of different potential training areas that we've talked about. But we need people to partner with us if we're really serious about doing this and we're really serious about invigorating the, the types of people that really understand regulatory science and what it takes to move forward in this arena, we want to start to think about how we get a critical mass of people to help us. So I just wanted to pitch this idea to you because we think that, that it's something that we'd like to just 
keep on your radar screen. If you're interested in this, you can come find me and say, hey, Chavre, this is something I'd like to partner with you on. But we, we think this is where we need to go. Everybody nods and agrees that this is something we need to do, but the challenge is what is it going to take to implement? So I leave you with the challenge, and I appreciate your time, and I'm sorry for all the feet standing, um, and I'm happy to entertain any questions, so thank you. Okay, so I can't uh, repeat the entire question, but I, I, will, I will cut to the, to, the, to the final part, which is what, what do I think are some of the barriers um, to the success of public-private partnerships in the consortia efforts? So we have been working with these consortia efforts since well before 2007. And I, I think one of the challenges first is intellectual property issues. So, as I said, you know, in the past, the challenge has been companies saying, you know, this is my intellectual property, I don't want to share it, you know, this is something that could give me a competitive edge, and, and it's going to be a little too hard for us to be able to move forward in the arena. What we've seen now, however, is that there is not as, as much reticence to being able to move forward to share information. I think the challenge has to do with what type of information is being shared. So for instance, in the biomarker space, we're seeing a lot of information that's been shared. Uh, we'd love to see information about failed drug development efforts being shared, but that's, that's not something that you know, we have any control over. Folks think that FDA has this huge repository that's well categorized, and all we do is hit a button, and all the information is available to you. I wish it was, but it's not, and even if it was, we don't own that information. That information and that data is, you know, belongs to whoever the, the sponsor is, the developer. So, you know, the challenge of getting people to want to share is one hurdle. Another hurdle is data standards, and this is an area one of the segments of my office is very focused on. So if you look at some of the recent FDA guidances, you'll start to see that the trend is changing towards really focusing on standardized data. What does that mean? That means that if we get a variety of data from clinical trials from three different sponsors, if you just look at something as simple as designating male versus female in a, in a trial, in one trial it may say male, female spelled out, in another MF, in another one, two. So the challenge of being able to aggregate all of that information, if, if for us to do analyses, or for consortia to be able to take, you say you have sponsors who are willing to share the information, they say, here's your data dump, here's all of our clinical trial data from X, Y, or Z. Well, the aggregation of that is humongous, and people don't realize that. And I think this is part of the challenge that we're really starting to focus on is we need to have data standards. We need to have ca things captured, metadata, data about the data, captured in a way that's uniform and that we all start to agree to. So we've been partnering with one consortium that's called CFAST. So it's the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium, partnering with CPATH. Um, which is a 501c3, to help move forward where are the areas where we need data standards in various therapeutic areas. So say diabetes, how does the clinical data, how is that clinical data represented? And over time, if you look at some of our guidance that, is, that are coming out, it's not going to be just a nice to have, it's going to be a must have. Because then what helps you is that then when that data comes in the door to us, we, my Office of Computational Science, is developing review tools that work with standardized data. So instead of a reviewer sitting in an office with 10 phone book size submissions of paper data, they're looking at the electronic data. And they're using data visualization tools to help them figure out where's the signal, how do I recreate this trial, what, what were the dropouts, where's the missing data, what's the quality issues. So that, hopefully over time, builds more efficiency in the review process. It helps us answer more questions and it helps us to do it effectively. But it also helps the consortia so that then as they start to aggregate that data, it makes it much less difficult. So that's one of the areas that I think is a huge challenge that people don't realize. We alone in FDA try to map some uh, 50 different trials on diabetes data to common data standards. It was an enormous task, and it took a tremendous amount of money. If we're really serious about streamlining medical product development, the data standards are the building block. We have to get the building blocks right. 
So um, that, that, that's, that's some of the challenge. And also I think the consortia needs to see the wins. We have to publicize the wins. You know, people think about consortia and they put their head down and they think, yeah, I've heard about this a zillion times. But we don't publicize the wins. They are doing some game-changing, tremendous stuff. But if we're not publicizing it and folks don't know about it, that's part of the challenge. Faster Cures also, this is my last aside about consortia. Faster Cures, Margaret Anderson, Melissa Stevens, um, I was in Brussels mm, maybe two, three years ago, and I pitched an idea to them, much like I pitched, I pitched an idea to you all tonight. And I pitched the idea of having a global mapping of consortia efforts. And I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could easily look around the globe and find out, okay, Alzheimer's disease, who are the different consortia that are working in this space? What have they accomplished? How can we work together? Well, two years later, they took that idea and they're about to launch the Consortiapedia, which is like a yellow pages of consortia efforts for around the world. I think this will be game changing because then you have disparate efforts that now are able to work together. The consortia, just as the, the components of the consortia need to work together, the consortia themselves need to work together. And we're starting to see that happening both in the domestic space as well as in the international space. That's where you get an economy of scale, and that's when you're able to really move things forward. And I think we're getting there. I'll stop talking. Okay, so, so, so the question is really, you know, how do you bridge this gap between the academic environment and the FDA environment? And how do you start to make resources available to academics? How do you incentivize that? Are there financial incentives? I can't really speak to the financial incentives part. But um, are there ways to really bridge some of this? So one thing I want to tell you about that, that is starting to address that, we have a new program that we launched in my office last year called the Critical Path Innovation Meetings. And I'm super excited about this. Dr. Woodcock is super excited about this because this is a type of program that's focused very early in drug development. Before you've had conversations, before you've submitted an IND or an NDA, before you even know what you're doing, we have a program now, and you can look on our website, you can Google Critical Path Innovation Meetings. I don't have a slide on this one that you can take pictures of. But um, you, what it does is it allows you to have a conversation with us. And it allows you to have a conversation with us that's outside of our normal regulatory review type A, B, C meetings. It's a conversation about the science. And Dr. Woodcock has said she would love to even have academics come in and talk to us, you know, through the context of that type of meeting. So the idea is to say, hey, I think I have this wonderful innovation. I need to figure out how do I move forward with this? What do I need to do? The Critical Path Innovation Meeting, you go in, you go online, you fill out the information, you give us you know, a quick five-page write-up or less about what it is that you want to do. We try and pull together the right stakeholders, not only from my center, but throughout the FDA to say, how can we talk with this person about this? These are non-binding meetings. They're meant to be educational, they're meant to be interactive, and they're meant to really be focused on the science. But the idea is to then give you a path forward, right? To be able to say, okay, you have this cool thing that you might want to do. What is it really going to take, do you know what I mean, to get there? And how might we be able to point you in the right direction? With that, at the same time, as I talked about pitching with this Regulatory Science Training Consortium, we realized that we need to really build more content for people, and we need to have that accessible, and we need to have that up and available so that we're not reinventing the wheel each time we talk to these folks because we realize there's a need. Now it's a matter of how to get that content lifted up and make it available. So with that, I've also been uh, meeting with Petra Coffin and uh, some of the folks at NIH with NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Science or what have you, because their investigators are having those same issues. And so we're talking with them about how do we start to build some of that content. But getting in the door quickly might be a critical path innovation meeting. Does that answer your question? Okay. So, uh, okay, so the, the question is basically, you know, and paraphrase for me if I'm, if I'm misinterpreting, but this, this idea of adaptive trial designs, being able to start with a smaller patient population, possibly being able to, to move forward from that to a broader patient population, w how we might be able to take that to move faster into a particular population. So, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more than just adaptive. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Right. Right. So, so this idea then of, of, of possibly having a, a, smaller, a smaller population and then you're broadening that to a larger population in order to, to look at that particular trial design. Those are things that we, we definitely, I, I can't speak broadly because everything is a case-by-case -case basis. It also depends on, you know, the, the indication, what we're able to do in certain situations where there are, you know, tremendous unmet needs versus areas where, you know, there's a host of drugs available may be very different. Um, we are open to having conversations, and especially if you're talking product neutral and you're really talking about the design, that is an area where the critical path innovation meetings would be right up your alley. Because if we're talking about a specific product and you want to move to get, you want to discuss an approval strategy for a specific product, well, that goes straight to the review division through the Office of New Drugs. If you're talking about a concept, a trial design that you want to explore to see how receptive are we? Is this something that you, we might buy into? And how might we be able to do it? And what are the potential pitfalls? You know, that's something that's right for a critical path innovation meeting. So I'd love for you to take a look at our website and submit a proposal. And then we can bring in, you know, the, the, the trial design folks, Bob Temple, you know, and all the others to really discuss, you know, what those challenges are. And I'd much rather, as I said, if you take nothing else home, have those early discussions with us. I'd much rather you have the early discussion and we point you down the right path than you invest a lot of funds developing something then at the end of the day we're saying, uh, that's not going to fly. So take a look, Google it, and uh, let us know. So, what, where, so um, with respect to the, the figure I showed in terms of the number of compounds that are in development and how long it takes and how much money it takes to get a, a product to market and where the potential failures are um, and, and some of the technology gaps. Um, one, of, one of the biggest areas that I think is a technology gap is really biomarker development. Um, it, it, biomarker development is a challenging area, you know, because the science has to evolve. <laughs> We, we have to, you know, have enough confidence in a particular biomarker in terms of its ability to predict an outcome. So I'll give you an example. Right now, um, we're working with a consortium um, to look at um, nephrotoxicity markers, markers of kidney injury, and trying to look at whether or not um, there are markers of kidney injury that may help us in an earlier way predict a negative outcome. But that has to be done reliable, reliably, reproducibly. We have to have the confidence. But if we, if we are able to do that, then you look at the normal measures of kidney injury, BUN, blood urea nitrogen, and creatinine. That's what they run on your you know, metabolic panel. But by the time you see those um, types of biomarkers go up, your kidneys are really having a challenge. So if we're able to start to have biomarkers that help us predict sooner, is there an injury? Is there a problem? Do you know what I mean? Then perhaps from a drug development standpoint, it helps us perhaps make go, no, go decisions much sooner. Do you know what I mean? Maybe that's not the product you take to market. You know, maybe that's not the one that you do the big phase three clinical trials in because you have a challenge perhaps, you know, earlier on. So we have to have the data. Modeling and simulation, that's a huge area as well. Pharmacometrics, helping us to really see whether we can model how, you know, how a particular drug is going to act. That's tremendously helpful. Natural history studies, looking at diseases and their natural history and ha having that to help us inform drug development. Those are areas that are big gaps. And it's areas where I think there are technology gaps that if we had more of that information and more information about the failures, if we had more information about the failures, that helps us to, in aggregate, understand, well, what may have gone wrong and are there trends? But if the companies are holding on to that information tightly and not sharing that information, then, you know, the rising tide never lifts all boats because we're not learning from it. So, you know, there are a variety of reasons for these failures. <laughs> but, you know, I think there's some things, you're right, that are technology challenges and there's science challenges where the science needs to evolve. If you were to ask me, you know, where academia could help us tremendously, it would be in these biomarker development efforts. Do you know? It's not necessarily looking at Drosophila, which are important to look at as well, but really looking at, <laughs> you know, um, some of these areas where we really have clinically relevant biomarkers and how do we aggregate the evidence to really have confidence in their use. That to me is a technology challenge, but that means we have to have more of a national effort to say, this is a problem, we need better predictors. 
how do we aggregate that information? How do we collect it in a standardized fashion? And how do we start you know, to really be able to utilize it to model from? Does that answer your question? Is it a burning question? Or right. So, so the, the question is really how, you know, how can small businesses or, or, or you know, um, um, groups that have innovative ideas come and partner with, with us better, new technologies, areas where it may be emerging that they may want to have conversations with us that are early, um, and how do we broker that engagement? And I'll say again, the Critical Path Innovation Meetings is a fantastic way to be able to do that. We have to be product neutral. So if you're focusing on a particular product, that goes to the review division. But what's wonderful is you still get in the door with us. So say you go to our website, you Google it, you fill out the form, you give us the information. We have a team of people that are looking at those proposals. Not only are we looking at those proposals to say, is this the right thing for an innovation meeting? I'll stop talking. Is this the right thing for an innovation meeting? But we're also saying, if it's not the right thing for an innovation meeting, how can we point them in the right direction? So, so it's a conduit in the door which is fantastic to do the types of things you're saying we're trying to you know be the kindler gentler cedar do you know what I mean that really lets us have these types of conversations because we've heard from our stakeholders hey maybe we're not ready for the big formal regulatory meeting we just have a question well now we have a way to really be able to start to address those things so I encourage you to take a look at the slide okay <laughs>